how in the world, in light of everything that we face, in light of everything that goes on in this world, how is it possible that you and I can say God is good in everything? The only way that you and I can have a view of existence like that is to have an eternal view, to live our life in the kingdom of God. Because oftentimes we so focus on the here and the now. And oftentimes in this world, obviously, life's not good. It's anything but good. It's incredibly painful. Uh, the whole story of Joseph that we've been going through over the past few weeks is clearly about this reality. But Joseph had an unbelievable ability, an unbelievable ability to see his existence through God's eyes in an eternal perspective. And beloved, the older I get, the more I realize how important that is instead of living in the moment. And the Bible, as you begin to unpack it and understand it, the Bible shows us this in so many places. I think of Esau, which is the brother of Jacob, who is actually Joseph's dad. And Esau, who technically, even though Jacob and Esau were twins, Esau was born first. And the birthright of the patriarchal family should have gone through him. And yet we learn in the story that there's a moment when Esau's out and he's hunting and he's hungry and his stomach is growling and, and, and Jacob has been making a porridge, a soup as it were, and he obviously was an amazing cook because that's all that filled Esau's nostrils. And Esau said, give me some of that. And so Jacob, his name being supplanter, the deceiver as it were, he said, I'll give you some, but give me your birthright. What did Esau do? No, the birthright, that's too valuable. I cannot throw it away for a simple bowl of soup. That's not what scripture records. Esau says to Jacob, what's the birthright to me if I'm dead? Give me the food. Think about that. He gives away his birthright to Jacob. We don't talk about Abraham, Isaac, and Esau. We talk about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob because of a bowl of soup. How many of us are throwing our lives away for a bowl of soup? We, we look at our world and we want what we want and we want it now and we think if I just get instant gratification in this moment, then all will be well. Instead of looking at our lives and crying out like we just sang, you are good God. You are good God in everything and in every way. Today I bring this message series to a culmination as it were this is one of the the pinnacle messages in this entire series we have a couple more weeks to go but this is where it really comes true a crescendo this is such an important message for you and for me every single one of us and what makes this message so important is because we live in a world wracked broken destroyed ruined by sin. And the very fact that sin is in this world, sin is in this world through other people, but sin is also in this world through you and through me. We all sin and fall short of the glory of God. That's what makes the concept of forgiveness so radically important in every one of our lives. And the scripture teaches so many places about this topic of forgiveness and the necessity of it. But this is one of the best, most incredibly thorough and articulated pictures of forgiveness the Bible shows us. Some of you in this room right now, you have broken the heart of someone. You have destroyed, as it were, a potential relationship with a family member, with a friend, with a spouse, with a child. And you've done this by some decision and, and you desperately long for and need in your life forgiveness. Some of you in this room, you have been the other side or the recipient of that kind of behavior. And you can point to someone in your life that has hurt you badly. And they're the ones in desperate need of forgiveness. But you are telling yourself as you sit here this morning, oh, it's nice, it's a good religious idea, but I could never, ever bring myself to forgive. 
That's a dangerous place to be because at the end of the day, that doesn't hurt the person. It hurts you. Regardless of the case, take your Bible and open it to the first book of the Bible itself in the Old Testament, the book of Genesis, as we continue through this study. Before I read the text, let me set the stage. This is such an important and sensitive topic. I'll never forget in the very first church that the Lord allowed me to pastor. I was just a kid, younger than my own children, and I'm pastoring this church. And I'll never forget there was a fellow who lived in the community where the church was placed. And he was a relatively new believer. And he was excited about his faith, very vocal about his faith. He, he, he let others know. And he had an immediate neighbor who did not believe. And as a matter of fact, was antagonistic and would make fun of him at every turn and every point. Because he claimed the claims of Christ. Well, this individual went to someone in the church, a well-meaning brother in Christ, who said, you know, the scripture says, before you can sacrifice, before you can serve, before you can surrender in your life to the various things of the Lord, you've got to leave that at the altar. Go get forgiveness, or give it, and then return. And this brother was so frustrated. He came to me and he said, Pastor Rob, I've got this issue. I don't like this guy. I, I, I can't bring myself to forgive him. And all he does is ridicule me over and over again. Well, I clearly recognized he had an issue. And to send him to his neighbor and tell his neighbor, I forgive you, would have been, that would have been a very difficult and challenging thing to do. Can you imagine? I forgive you. <laughs> What's the guy going to do? He's just going to make fun of him. He's just going to further be antagonistic towards this brother. So he sat down with me and we began to pray about it. And I said, here's what I want you to do. Don't worry about that. We are all responsible on our own for our personal relationship with the Lord Jesus. And it's out of that relationship True forgiveness, authentic forgiveness flows. To manufacture it does no good. That's based on you and your own deeds. So here's what I want you to do. You do come to Bible studies. You do come out on the visitation ministry with us. Go ahead and read your Bible. If you have any questions, get involved. So it kind of gave him a release. He didn't have this weight over him that he had to go immediately to his neighbor and knock on his door. You're never going to believe what happened. Several months later, this brother comes running up to the church one afternoon. He bangs on the, my, my, my office. Pastor, pastor, i got to tell you what happened. Oh, okay, brother, what's going on? He said, you're never going to believe this. I'm outside and I'm mowing my grass yesterday. And so as I'm mowing away, I notice there comes my neighbor pulling in. I'm thinking, oh, here we go again. And soon, I'm just trying to ignore him. I'm just mowing, mowing, mowing away. And all of a sudden, I see that he stops right next to the yards where, they, where they're adjacent. He's just standing there staring at me. And I'm thinking, oh, this is bad. He's going he's gonna to really do something to me. And as I get a little closer to him, trying to pretend he's not there, I see him kind of motioning to me. And I'm thinking, this is going to get really bad. And sure enough, I get a little closer and I recognize, wait a minute, his eyes are red. Something's wrong. I shut my mower and I walk over to him. And he said, listen, man, you're a Christian, aren't you? It's obvious. Yes, I am. He said, look, I know I've been a real jerk to you, but I don't have anybody else to talk to and I don't know who to talk to. And he said, I had this relationship with this girl in my life for many, many years and she did something that was just heinous and horrible to the guy, and it was awful, and he was broken, and he had nobody to turn to. He said, Pastor, I got to pray with that guy. I got to share Jesus with him, and I didn't do anything. I looked at him. I said, sounds like the Holy Spirit to me. 
That's authentic forgiveness. That's true forgiveness. He was able to tell him when he said, I'm sorry I've done this to you. Hey, look, I get it. No problem. That's the way this thing works, beloved. It's through the power and, and the reality of a, a restored relationship with Jesus. If you're in this room, and I guarantee every one of us, every single one of us in this room at some juncture in our life has been touched with this issue. Somebody has hurt us or we have hurt someone else. This is a message directed to every one of us. And ultimately, every single one of us needs ultimate forgiveness through Jesus. If you're in this room and you don't quite understand what that means, what actual forgiveness is, then it could be you've never met Jesus because that's where real forgiveness begins. As I've been telling you through this whole study in the life of Joseph, Joseph is a type of Jesus. He shows us so clearly what Jesus is like and who Jesus is. And more than any place in this narrative today shows us Jesus in a big way. Look at verse 1 with me, please, in the 45th chapter of the book of Genesis. This, of course, follows the reality that Joseph, over the last several weeks we've been looking at this, he's been sort of playing a cat and mouse game, trying to decipher where his brothers are, trying to get Benjamin back to see Benjamin, trying to see if they'll treat Benjamin, because Benjamin obviously is favored just like he was, Trying to see if they'll treat him like they, they treat Benjamin like they treated him. And, and he's learning his brothers have really had a radical change. And God is working in their life. Now it's come to a point where he's going to reveal himself to his brothers. Now I don't want this to... <laughs> when you read the text, it's, it's so matter of fact. It doesn't truly do a great job. So I'm going to try to do my best to unpack what is actually occurring here. You need to understand that over 27 years have passed since these rascals sold their brother Joseph to slavery in Egypt. And now we're told Joseph is actually the ruler of the nation. We know that Pharaoh is, but basically Pharaoh has delegated that to Joseph. There is no one more powerful than Joseph except the Pharaoh. These brothers don't know who they've been dealing with. They have no clue who's been giving them money back in their sacks. They have no clue who's been giving them food and grain for their family. They're about to find out. And I mean, put yourself in their place. Look at the text. Verse 1. Then Joseph could not control himself before all those who stood by him. And he cried. Have everyone go out from me. So there was no man with him when Joseph made himself known to his brothers. And he wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard it, and the household of Pharaoh heard of it. Then Joseph said to his brothers, now watch this, he's been talking in in the Egyptian dialect. Now he's shifting gears in order for his brothers to understand him. It's not only that he's revealing himself, but he shifts gears and he talks to them in Hebrew. Their language. You talk about a shocker. You can't see that here in the English, but that's what happens. He shifts gears and now he begins to talk to them in a language that they had no clue. They've been talking in Hebrew thinking he doesn't know what they're saying. And he knows everything they've been saying. Then Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Wow! They've convinced themselves he's dead. He doesn't exist anymore. They've been telling Joseph he's dead. And now, out of his mouth, I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? This is where the Bible is replete with understatement. But his brothers could not answer him, for they were dismayed at his presence. You think? I mean, this is a shock. That word, by the way, translated dismayed, I'll get back into that in a moment. It's powerful. Look at verse 4. Then Joseph said to his brothers, please come closer to me. And they came closer. And he said, I am your brother Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. And now, do not be grieved or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. 
For the famine has been in the land for these two years, and there are still five years in which they will be neither plowing nor harvesting. And God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant in the earth and to keep you alive by a great deliverance. Now, therefore, it was not you who sent me here, but God. And he has made me a father to Pharaoh and the Lord of all of his household and ruler over all of Egypt. Let's pray. Father. Help these words to not fall on deaf ears this morning. Lord, every single human being in this room right now and every person listening to me online is touched by this topic. None of us escapes because we're all sinners. We all need forgiveness. We need to give forgiveness. And Lord, my prayer is not a single person listening would walk away not grappling with this topic. Oh, they may walk away doing nothing about it, but at least, Lord, my prayer is your Holy Spirit would convict each and every one of us of this issue. It's so necessary in the world in which we live. And ultimate forgiveness comes from you and what you've done in our lives. For it's in your precious name we pray. And for your sake, amen. I'll never forget, I won't get into it, but there's a lot in my life that I have done where I've hurt people who have needed or who I've needed forgiveness from and they've given it and it's been the most amazing thing in the world and there are others who have hurt me desperately. And I've seen people that get stuck in a rut like that become so bitter and seeping in that that anger and resentment and, 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 and animosity that they become no good to anyone nor themselves. And I praise God through the Lord Jesus that he's given me the ability to give forgiveness where it's been needed to be given. This touches my life so powerfully and this message that I'm bringing to you today is a principle that God built into my life so many years ago. There are five key things in this text that are unbelievable. You think, how in the world can a thousands of year old Bible text have anything to do with my life today? This is definitely one of those texts. The first thing that I want you to see out of this is simply the statement, and all these will be on your screen. Forgiveness brings a release or a cleansing of the soul. This is actually in the person who's offering forgiveness. May I say to you, by the way, it's the person who's hurt the most that has the power to forgive. That is a lot of power. If you've been broken, if you've been hurt by someone else, you hold within your purview the ability to offer forgiveness. Anybody can get even. Anybody can settle the score. But can you forgive? I praise God when I look at the Lord Jesus Christ that he didn't settle the score. Because it was my sin that drove the nails in his hands. That was my choices that put the spear in his side. The crown of thorns that Jesus wore was put on him because of me and my stupid sinful decisions. I did that, and so did you. Aren't you thankful Jesus didn't want to settle the score? His words were, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. You think that had to do with just the people who were accusing him and who were driving nails in his hands? That had to do with every single one of us. Every one of us. And so... Forgiveness brings a release and a cleansing of the soul. This is from the human perspective anyway for the forgiver. When you look at verses 1 and 2, look at Joseph. Can you imagine? The Bible pictures him as weeping so loudly that the Egyptians 
hear it. All of the people that serve him, that work with him, hear it. And the household of Pharaoh hears of it. And you can only imagine that in every tear that he sheds, it's like a washing. All that pain, if there's any resentment, all of that begins to go away. All the hurt that the brothers initially wanted to kill him. They took the coat of many colors that his father had given him. They, they threw him in a pit to die, as I've said so many times. They went and had a meal after that. When he himself could have been a meal for a wild animal. And then ultimately they sell him just without care into slavery. And after they sell him, they get the money and whatever they made from him. What do they do with that money? It's horrible money. We never know. The Bible doesn't say. But that's what they've done to him. And all the pain of going to Potiphar's house and then being falsely accused and then spending years in prison for being falsely accused. All of that struggle, all of that pain, all of that separation is washed away in the tears that he cries. Beloved, if you've been hurt, if somebody has hurt you, you are not doing yourself any favor by holding on to that bitterness, by hoping that they get their own. If you do that, all you're doing is making yourself sick. It's like a spiritual cancer that will eat you alive from the inside out. Release it and let it go. Look to Jesus. There's no way you and I in our flesh have the ability to forgive like that. But in Christ Jesus, we can do that. He who has been forgiven much can forgive. That's what the scripture teaches. And so if we have been forgiven by Jesus, how in the world can we pretend to hold a grudge against someone else? If you claim to be a follower of Jesus, if I claim to be a follower of Jesus and I am unwilling to extend forgiveness... I better check my heart. There's a problem. Because Jesus has forgiven me of the the most putrefying of sins that would send me for all eternity to a place called hell. And he's given me his grace and his mercy. It's time to let it go and to let that wash away. Just like Joseph. I can only envision in every tear the, the, the more... Love that begins to flow from his heart. And we're going to see how that works. It's, it's an amazing thing, thing. So some of us need to do some crying today. Some of us need to do some revealing today. We need to tell somebody, you're forgiven. Now what they do with it, that's on their own. But you and I are responsible for our demeanor and our attitude toward those who have hurt us. The second thing this text shows us It's very powerful because we live our lives, for the most part, in a delusion. We think so highly of ourselves. We think things don't touch us like they touch us. And look at this. Forgiveness brings the sinner face to face with their sin. I point out verse 3 about that. (laughs) These guys, you know how it is. You tell a lie. And then pretty soon, after time goes by, maybe you start believing your lie. We told Dad he was mauled by a wild animal. I'm sure that's basically what happened to him anyway, even though we fudged it a little bit, right? We put the coat of many colors in that sheep's blood, but Dad never knew, and, and, and that's the way it is. He is no more. They've been telling everybody Joseph is dead. And all of a sudden, it's like smacking him in the face. Smacking him in the face. I am Joseph. Immediately their mind goes back to that place where they were shepherding those sheep, where that that cistern, that pit where they took him and they mangled him and they threw him in the pit. All of that comes back up. And then I can imagine they start looking at each other. It was your fault. I didn't want to do it. No, you wanted to do it. I'm just going along with the plan. That's what's happening. All in one fell swoop. How do I know that? This word, translated in my version, dismayed, this is an interesting Hebrew word. It literally means, I kid you not, to palpitate. Meaning, 
They were so terrified. Have you ever been that scared? I mean, something jolts you into a reality of terror and you can feel your heart just pumping inside of your chest. You're so afraid. Just in the words, I am Joseph. They are terrified. Let me tell you something, beloved. Some of us need to hear another I am. Do you know God's name is Yahweh, I am. That's what his name actually is. And some of us need to be in terror at the name of God. The very fact that God could remove, as it were, our, our oxygen in a moment's notice or without a moment's notice. But we casually go about our days as if we just take it for granted. We just think the blood is going to continue to surge through our veins and our hearts are going to pump. And we give God no second thought. We go about our day. We do what we do. Get what we can get. Not even giving a second thought that God is standing there all the time in front of us saying, I am. All you have to do is look at his universe. I am. Look at the beauty of his creation. He says it all over the place. I am. Open his word and clearly he tells us, I am. And yet we just ignore it. Some of us need to have some palpitating hearts in this place today. We don't even understand what real forgiveness is because we don't understand the terror of a holy, perfect God that could totally annihilate and ruin us if he chose to, and yet he continues to be patient. He continues to be long-suffering. He continues to give us grace. He continues to let us live our lives every day as if he doesn't exist. You say, not me. I believe in Jesus, and I go about my day thinking about God sometimes. That's the truth about all of us. As a matter of fact, for the follower of Jesus, God should be our preeminent thought in Jesus about every second of every moment of every day, every decision we make. Would Jesus want us to, to do this? Is this for the kingdom? Is this greater? Are we looking at this through his eyes? But we don't do that because we live in sinful flesh. And we are given his grace. But we need to be face to face with who we are and what our sin is. And that's exactly what happens. These brothers could never receive genuine forgiveness until they come face to face with their sin. Can't cover it up anymore. Can't lie about it anymore. What's going to happen when dad finds out? I am Joseph. Mm. Have you come face to face with your sin this morning? Maybe you're the one that hurt somebody else in your family. Maybe you're the person that hurt a friend or a child or a parent. And maybe it's you that needs to come face to face with what you've done. Quit sweeping it under the rug. Quit trying to pretend it didn't happen. Face to face and hear the words, I am Joseph. The third thing that this text shows us very clearly Forgiveness brings closeness and restores broken relationships. Many weeks ago when we started this in chapter 37, in verse 18, when Joseph was sent by Jacob to go check on his brothers, they assumed he went to spy on them. He was going to check on them because his dad did care. And the Bible says as he came close, as he came close, the brother said, here comes the dreamer, let's kill him. Now look at this different scenario. In verse 4, Joseph said to his brothers, please come closer to me. Wow. That's powerful. There's so much beauty in that. Please come closer to me. No longer now do they see Joseph through the green glasses of envy. They finally see him for who he really is. They see his real heart. It's the same Joseph. Has he learned a lot? Has he grown a lot? Has God molded him? Certainly. But he's the same guy that they didn't see before. That's the beauty of this, beloved. Beloved. When we experience true forgiveness, do you realize that from the time of Adam and Eve, when Adam and Eve ate the fruit they were not supposed to eat, 
and God came looking for them, what was their posture? They ran and they hid. All of us do the same thing. God is there. He's here and everywhere. And he looks for us. And what do we do? We run and we hide. We want nothing to do with the one true God. Oh, we'll create God in our own image. We'll put him in a nice, neat little box that we think we can control. But when it comes to the one true God, specifically Jesus, when he comes, we, want to, we don't want to get close. Because that closeness reminds us just how far away and how horrible we actually are. So if we're going to get close, it's not by anything that you and I do. You can never earn God's grace or merit his favor. Uh, There's no way. God demands ultimate perfection from my life. So if I'm going to come closer, it has to be by an invitation of Jesus. And at the cross and in the power of his resurrection, now he puts himself and us in a place where he says, come closer to me. Get to know the real me. That's what Joseph is showing us here. Come close, he says in verse 4. And they came closer. I am your brother Joseph, whom you sold into slavery in Egypt. I am the God of this universe, whom you alone with your sin crucified on the cruel Roman cross. Come close to me, Jesus says. Do you hear it? If you've never heard those words, beloved, and you're sitting in this room and you've never truly come close to Jesus, I'm not asking if you're Baptist. I'm not asking if you're a good religious person or what you belong to. What I'm asking is, do you know Jesus? Have you heard him calling, come close to me, knocking on your heart's door? Yes, you've blown it, but guess what? I paid for it all. My blood will wash away your sin. Come close to me. I'm Jesus, whom you sold, as it were, into slavery because of your sin. But guess what? I defeated it. I have won in the power of resurrection. And so Joseph is the ruler of all of Egypt. Joseph, in the power of forgiveness, restores the broken relationship. Here's another beautiful point the text shows us that benefits you and me. The fourth thing this text shows us, forgiveness brings a release from guilt. A release from guilt. And I see that in the first part of verse 5. Don't be grieved or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. Again, I want to reference the original language. This was written in Hebrew. And that word translated into English in my version, grieved, is also an interesting word. It literally means to fabricate emotional pain. It could be physical pain, it could be anything, but in this sense it's emotional pain. So Joseph is basically saying don't fabricate emotional pain from a wrong perspective. I'm going to tell you why their perspective is wrong. And I'm going to tell you in just a moment one of the most profound points of this entire message in the power of forgiveness. But at this moment, a lot of us carry around a lot of grief. We carry around a lot of stuff. And we fabricate this emotional pain. But we don't have the whole picture. We don't see the whole picture. And I told you that a couple weeks ago when we compared Jacob, the father of Joseph, with Joseph. When Joseph is, is viewing his circumstances, he's looking at his circumstances from an eternal perspective, from living in the kingdom of God. Jacob, his whole life was built on a lie. He thought Joseph was dead. He thought the animals had mauled Joseph. And he thought that now the man in Egypt wanted to take his other younger favorite son, Benjamin. And nothing could have been further from the truth. He too was fabricating, grieving, wanting to go, as the Bible says, his gray hair going down to Sheol, the place of the dead, grieving in a wrong manner. How many of us in this room are in that same boat? Listen, if somebody has hurt you, tragically, maybe you say they're never going to come and and offer forgiveness. Or or, or, um, you may say, I may never be able to offer forgiveness Get forgiveness from Jesus, and then you can offer it to them. 
It's a powerful truth. Don't grieve in a way that is false. You say, wait a minute, the the brothers did this crazy thing. They are the ones that sold Joseph into slavery. They should be grieving. Yeah, in the immediate perspective, but Joseph shows them something bigger, which brings me to my final and most profound, most amazing, if you've not heard me say anything, listen to this point. Forgiveness, number five, reveals God's greater plan. Through the power of forgiveness, through the results that that Joseph is offering these brothers, they finally come to the understanding of something they had no clue they were actually a part of. And here's the kicker. God used them even though their decision was wrong and sinful. That's how big God is. You think it was right for them out of jealousy to sell Joseph into slavery? Absolutely not. To lie 20 plus years to their father? Absolutely heinous. But that didn't thwart God's purpose. As a matter of fact, God is so big, so amazing, so awesome, he used it. And Joseph brings them into the knowledge of that. Look at 5b. For God sent me before you to preserve life. He talks about the famine. It's been in the land these two years, and there are still five years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvesting. And God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant in the earth and to keep you alive by a great deliverance. Now, therefore, watch this. It was not you who sent me here, but God. And he has made me a father to Pharaoh and Lord over all his household and ruler over all the land of Egypt. See, God is doing this. Joseph clearly sees that. God is the one that's allowing these things to happen. God is the one that's causing these things to be. These brothers had no clue that all their life has been lived under the sovereign plan and purpose of God. God used their heinous, horrible decisions. Let me tell you something. Some of you in this room, you might say, you don't know what I've done, Rob. What I've done is unforgivable. I'm a louse, I'm a wretch, I'm horrible. Don't fall prey to that. Don't be Esau. Look at the bigger picture. God is working in and above, and nothing you and I do is too bad or too big to thwart God's plans. He is always on his throne. And so now these brothers finally come into this unbelievable awareness that they're a part of a plan they never dreamed or imagined existed. Does that mean they they can't repent? Of course not. No, they're going to repent big time, as we'll see in the last couple weeks. they got to go back, and they got to go get Dad and say, "Uh, Dad, remember that uh, coat uh, you gave Joseph a few years ago? Um, We kind of have to tell you something about that. Can you imagine? Well, there's going to be consequences for their actions, but the big picture is this. God has been working all along, men, And even though you made bonehead decisions, guess what? God was at work. And God used even your wrong decisions for a greater purpose. Don't let the devil fool you in this room this morning. No matter what you've done, God can redeem it. God can fix it. God can use you in a way you've never dreamed or imagined. God can take the pain and the hurt that you experience, turn it around for beauty, take the ashes and bring beauty out of it in your life. Just surrender to the Lord Jesus Christ and his forgiveness. Some of you in this room, you may say, I'm not even sure I believe there is a God. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. God is God, and you are his creation. Whether you acknowledge that or not, he's still using you. Even if your decisions are wrong, he has a plan and a purpose that is coming to fruition, whether you recognize it or not. So I don't like that, Rob. Well, don't t- t- take it up with God, not me. God is on his throne. We need to live life surrendered with the power of authentic forgiveness that only comes from Jesus and then through Jesus to others. How about it? How about it, beloved? Do you recognize, like these brothers finally did, what purpose and what plan they played in God's ultimate universal plan? They needed to sell Joseph into slavery. Joseph had to go ahead of them. 
That was important. Doesn't make their decision right. It's like Judas. Judas, he can't, he can't say at the, at the throne room of God one day, hey, God, you can't, you can't, if I hadn't sold Jesus for 30 pieces of silver, he never would have been crucified. No. No, as the Sanhedrin told Judas, when Judas feels guilty, he throws the 30 pieces of silver back at their feet. I've betrayed innocent blood, he said. You know what they told him? What's that to us? Go see to that yourself. You know what he did? He saw to it himself. He hanged himself. He is without forgiveness. There was no hope. Now the apostle Peter, same thing, denied knowing Jesus, even though he said, I'll never deny you. Never. But he did it anyway. What's the difference between Peter and Judas? Peter returned. And sought the Lord Jesus. You can see it in John 21. Jesus restored him. That's the difference. Also, we're told that Jesus prayed for Peter. Before the cock crowed in the morning. When he denied knowing Jesus three times. Not Judas. But God used Judas for an ultimate purpose. Everything is used by God. For his plan and purpose. Well, i got to quit. Do you need forgiveness this morning? The first place to understand true forgiveness is in Jesus. If you are honestly in this room, everyone in this room may think, oh, I'm already a believer in Jesus. I'm a follower of Jesus. I was born into a Christian family. That's not what I'm asking. Have you personally met Jesus as your Savior and Lord? Jesus loves you so much. He wants to give you ultimate grace and forgiveness And embrace you in a relationship. This isn't religion. It's a relationship you and I can have. We can come closer. But we got to surrender. Some of you need to surrender this morning. I'm going to tell you how to do that in just a moment. Some of you do know Jesus as your Savior. But some of you, man, you have hurt others badly. It's time to seek the Lord for forgiveness and pray. Pray that God works through those moments. Some of you need to offer forgiveness and you hold that power in your hand and you're telling yourself, not me, I'll never forgive, I'll never forgive, I'll never forgive. Thank thank God that Jesus didn't say that. And if he can forgive you and me, who are we to say, I'll never forgive? We're living like Esau if that's the case. We better start looking with an eternal perspective. The altar's open In just a moment, if you need to pray, if you need to offer forgiveness, get forgiveness, seek forgiveness, ask Jesus to be your Savior. We have deacons and staff that are willing to pray with you. I encourage you. Seek God where he can be found today, right now. We never know. We never have a guarantee of the next moment in our life. Today, right now, in this moment, Jesus can be found because he's here. Where two or three are gathered together, I am there in the midst. Are you going to seek him today? Let's pray. Father. Thank you for your grace, your mercy, your love, your word. Thank you for the power of true forgiveness. Thank you for showing us today the results of forgiveness. Lord, help this to be real in our lives in such a way that we embrace it fully and wholeheartedly. Meaning true forgiveness is really found ultimately in you. And so, Father, today, as we close this service, my prayer is that each and every person who needs forgiveness, who needs to extend forgiveness, and who ultimately needs eternal forgiveness in you, won't leave today without embracing you in this way. We love you, Jesus, and we praise you. For it's in your name we pray and for your sake. Amen. Now, I know I just said amen, but I want to ask you one more time to close your head, close your eyes and bow your heads. If you're in this room and you've never given your heart to Jesus, I don't care if everyone in this room, like I said earlier, believes that you have. It doesn't matter what others think. What matters is what you have done with Jesus. So if you need Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior today, you say, Rob, how can, how can I truly have a relationship like you're describing? Well, the Bible's very clear. It's profound, but it's simple. So right where you sit, with every head bowed and every eye closed, pray this simple prayer right where you sit, quietly in your heart. 
Dear Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a Savior. Or I know that I need a Savior. I know I'm a sinner. And Jesus, I ask you today to forgive me of my sin. Today I confess you as Lord of my life. I know you're in control of everything. And today I believe in my heart that you were raised from the dead. Thank you for saving me in Jesus' name. Now every head is still bowed, every eye is still closed. If you just prayed that prayer or something like it, based on the scripture, what the Bible teaches us, the Bible says you shall be saved. If you just prayed that prayer, nobody's looking around right now. I just want to know so I can know how to pray for you. I'm not going to call you out or call you forward. That's going to be on you. But if you just pray that prayer, is there anyone in this room that asked Jesus for forgiveness this morning? Anyone? Just slip up your hand and put it back down. Anyone? Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Thank you. Anyone else? Thank you. Thank you. Hands everywhere. Anyone else? Thank you. Thank you. That's the most important decision you will ever make. I want to challenge you. If you ask Jesus to be your Savior and Lord today, will you come forward, grab myself or Pastor Luis? One of the deacons will be willing to come forward and help and pray with you. We'll have someone here for you. But let somebody know. Jesus said, if you will not confess me before men, how will I confess you before my Father who's in heaven? Don't be afraid. Don't be ashamed. Come forward in front of this group. I promise there's only going to be rejoicing over your decision when we stand. If you're in this room today, maybe some of you would say, Rob, now every head is still bowed, every eye is still closed. You say, Rob, I have really hurt somebody with something I've done. I really messed it up. I blew it. I need help. If that's you, again, nobody's looking around. Just slip up your hand. Slip up your hand. Anybody? Rob, I've blown it. I, I've really hurt somebody. I've, I, I've really, really hurt somebody. Anyone? No one looking around. That's a tough one to raise your hand on. <laughs> Truth is, beloved, we all have. Every one of us. Whether we raise our hand or not. Some of you would say, I have been hurt. Somebody's really hurt me. Maybe in a moment you'd be willing to come out of the pew and come down to one of these altars and pray and leave that here. And go and be willing by the power of the Holy Spirit to offer forgiveness to those who hurt you. Take a lesson from Joseph and ultimately from Jesus. Father, again, I pray for everyone in this room at this time of invitation, give courage where courage is needed if people need to come forward and make decisions public or pray at the altar. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand for our feet as we sing. Parents, I know if you've got to pick your child up in the back, you've got to slip out, please do so quietly. I understand that, but this is the Lord's time. So if you need to come when we sing, you come forward right now. Let's declare, I will call. And I will call upon. The altar is open if you need to come come now now is the time now is the moment this is your time don't leave today without having made peace with God about whatever it is in your life you need to do that with this is your moment don't let the oceans overtake you don't drown in the bitterness and, and anger of your sorrow you come right now as God leads Pastor Nate you come
Some have come to pray. Some are coming to pray with them. Are you sitting there thinking, I need to go. I, I, I need to lay this burden down today. I can't carry it another mile. I can't carry it another moment. This is God's opportunity in your life to surrender. The altar is still open. If you need to come, you come. I promise you, someone will pray with you. If you need to let us know, you've asked Jesus in your heart as Lord and Savior, then come, let us know that. Pastor Nick. Spirit, lead me where my trust is filled down borders. Let me walk upon the waters wherever you will call me. Take me deeper than my feet could ever wander. And my faith will be made stronger in the presence of Let's sing one more time. Some are still praying. If you raised your hand, you didn't come forward, that's okay. Let me challenge you to do something. It's wonderful that you acknowledged what you've done. It's wonderful that you acknowledged your need for Jesus. Tell somebody else that you did that. It's so important too. I encourage you to do that. As these are still praying, I wanna introduce you to somebody I didn't get a chance to introduce you to last week. Brother Gordon, would you come forward please? Brother Gordon, if you noticed several weeks ago, he followed the Lord in believer's baptism. And he was out of town last weekend when I introduced the folks that went through our community of faith class to connect more intentionally with Crossbridge Church, to become a member of Crossbridge Church so God can use and work through their lives. And Brother Gordon Whalen has come. He's been baptized. I got the privilege of doing that. He's asked Jesus in his heart. He's already serving anyway, but I just, I asked him yesterday, I said, you got to come forward so that everybody, if you don't already know Gordon, you got you to get to know Gordon. What a blessing it is to have Gordon as part of our family. We are a family, and so make sure that you really embarrass him, hug him, and all that good stuff, and, and, and let him know what a blessing it is to have him as a part of our family. Thank you, my brother. Thank you. Love you. God bless you. I thank God for the worship team. You guys are incredible. Thank you for being used by God, whether you're playing or singing or leading an instrument, whatever, as an instrument of the Holy Spirit to work in our lives. God really used you today. What a great church. What an amazing family. So many people are broken and hurting and they need this. Will you be diligent to invite somebody to be a part of this? Somebody you know in your life who maybe needs forgiveness, who is broken, her, or who needs the Lord Jesus Christ. And just invite them. VBS is a great time to start that. I'm teaching an adult class along with the children's class. So there's something for everybody. I encourage you to be involved in that way. Well, we're going to close the service today. Brother Ryan Thiessen, do you mind to come and close us in a word of prayer brother Ryan by the way I'm not going to make it about age but you are one of our youngest deacons Ryan is such an amazing brother in Christ his, God has been using him so mightily in teaching our grief share class on Wednesday night God using the challenges that he's been through seeing through an eternal perspective to help others it's a beautiful thing thank you brother Ryan for being used by God in that way just like Joseph would you close us in a word of prayer, please?